seems like every year you hear of more and more people making this sad decision to take their own lives. And in our society, it seems like depression is rampant. And I don't mean this morning to downplay someone that has a chemical imbalance. But I believe that depression is rampant because people do not know why they are here. What is our purpose in this life? Why are we here on this earth? I hope you know the answer to this, but if not, I hope by the time this sermon is done, you will know the answer to this. There was a man in the Bible named Solomon, and he asked this question, why am I here? What is the purpose of life? And notice with me Ecclesiastes chapter 1. In verse 1 and following, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? And it sounds like a bleak outlook on life that Solomon has. He says, Emptiness of emptiness, senselessness of senselessness, worthlessness of worthlessness. That word vanity is hevel. That's the Hebrew word. It means like a smoke or a fog. And we might think of the illustration, it looks solid, but you go to reach out for it and you grab it and it goes through your fingertips. It's impossible to hold. And in verse 4, Solomon talks about manner of life. One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. And Solomon talks about there, if you will, the circle of life. And he says, man is born, he lives, and he dies. And it's a cycle over and over again in one generation, generation X, generation Y, generation Z, and so on. The sun also ariseth. And the sun goeth down and hasteth to his place where he arose. And Solomon's about to make a point here. He's talking about, I want you to catch this trend. Things that are circular and things that are perpetual. That's the idea Solomon wants to give. The sun ariseth and the sun goeth down. And we know that the earth spins around the sun, but Solomon is talking accommodatively here, just like your weatherman does. The sun rise, the sunset today is... Notice what he talks about in verse 6. The wind goeth toward the south and turneth about the north. It whirleth about continually and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. What are you talking about here, Solomon? Well, if you've never heard of this idea, maybe you've heard of the idea of a jet stream. Those constant winds that go around the earth, easterlies and westerlies. You think about uh, a thousand years ago. And the way they got from continent to continent wasn't by flying on a plane, but they had these sail ships, these trade ships, and they had what they knew as trade winds. Constant winds, they always went in the same path, circular, and they could be count on, counted on perpetual. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Under the place from whence the rivers come, thither they turn again. And we learn of this cycle from an early age, right? The water cycle. Evaporation, condensation in the clouds, precipitation. Sometimes it comes down as sleet, rain, or snow, but one thing is constant. It always goes up, and it always comes back down. All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing nor the ear filled with hearing. He said, life is just the same over and over. The eye is not satisfied with seeing. I'm I'm Solomon. I've seen so much, and nothing that I've ever seen has given me satisfaction. I study wisdom, and nothing I've ever heard has given me satisfaction. The thing that hath been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Well, I have a, a cell phone in my pocket. Solomon didn't have that. What does he mean there's, there's no new thing under the sun? Solomon means in manner of life, 
there's nothing new. A man is born, he lives a life, and he dies. Man is born, he lives a life, and he dies over and over again for thousands of years. That is how it's been. For every man that has ever lived until now, that is how it's been. There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. I, the preacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. You could break down this text in three main points. The problem stated, the problem studied, and the problem solved. Solomon here states his problem. There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. And then he hears a statement in verse 13, And I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under the heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. And Solomon says, I sought out to find what this life is all about. And who but Solomon could do this? I could never know if riches would fulfill a man. There's always going to be somebody with more money than me. I couldn't know if wisdom can fulfill a man. There's always going to be somebody with more wisdom than me. But who better than Solomon to do this? Who do you know that had more wealth than Solomon, more wisdom than Solomon, more experiences in life than Solomon? I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity. There's that word hevel again, emptiness, senseless, worthless. It's like smoke. You reach for it, but you can't hold it. And that's this next idea, and vexation of spirit. Some translations might translate that, grasping for the wind. And you think about trying to hold the wind in your hand. It's not something that's hard to do. It's something that's impossible to do. Solomon said, in all these things that I try to find satisfaction in under the sun, I've tried and I've tried to find satisfaction in them, and I can't find no satisfaction. That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. I commune with mine own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate, and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge, and I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive this also is vexation of spirit. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. Now we're going to notice in a moment how Solomon tried to find satisfaction in life. But before we do that, if you remember, Solomon said, there is nothing new under the sun. Think about how men try to find satisfaction today. What avenues would you say men search uh, satisfaction in? How do men try to give purpose to this life in modern day? And then as we read, tell me if Solomon was any different at all. And I turned myself uh, to behold wisdom. I'm sorry, verse two, or chapter 2, verse 1. I said in mine heart, go to now. I will prove thee with mirth. Therefore enjoy pleasure, and behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of mirth, what doeth it? I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting my, my heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly till I might see what, what, what was that good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. Notice this, I made me great works. I builded me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards. I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens. I had servants born in my house. Also I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. 
I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasures of kings and of provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the Son of Men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great and increased more than all they that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And if you remember, I asked you, how do men try to find satisfaction today? Maybe wisdom, wealth, wine, works. And how are men today any different than Solomon? And let me ask you this, if Solomon who had so many uh, riches, so, so much riches, if he could not find satisfaction in that great amount of riches, what makes us think that we can? If Solomon who had all this worldly wisdom could not find satisfaction in that, what makes us think that we can? And notice Solomon's problem. One of Solomon's problem was a problem of perspective. Because Solomon didn't have the whole picture. Solomon was looking for satisfaction in one place. Solomon was looking for satisfaction under the sun, under the sun, under the sun. A phrase that we see over and over again. Solomon's problem was that he was looking in the wrong place. If you didn't catch those reoccurring words in chapter 2, catch this, starting in verse 1, I said in mine heart, I will. I said, verse 2. I sought in mine heart, verse 3. I, me, I, me, I, verse 4. I, me, verse 5. I, me, verse 6. I, me, verse 7. I, me, verse 8. On and on and over and over again. The problem with Solomon was chap, uh, chapter 2, verse 10. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Solomon's problem is he thought he was a dog. And what do I mean by that? If you give a dog whatever that dog wants, that dog is going to be just as happy as can be. If that dog has an itch on the ear and you scratch it, if he's hungry and you give him a bowl of food, and then you just insert a porch with just the right amount of sun, and that dog will lay up there and be just as happy as can be. But men are not like dogs. I think men are more like horses. Because, you know, the number one cause of death to a horse is a horse founders. This happens pretty often. And what causes that is obesity in the horse. The horse overeats. And that's because a horse doesn't know when to stop eating. A horse doesn't have uh, the feeling of fulfillment in it. So it just keeps eating and eating and eating till you pull it away. And man's no different because here's man's problem. Man has a spiritual hunger, but he tries to fill it with physical food. Man's a twofold being, physical and spiritual. And sometimes we get that confused. We take our spiritual hunger and try to fill it with physical food. We try to fill it with riches, with a fast car, with a nice big house, with lots of money, lots of uh, that type of thing. Verse 11, Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on all the labor that I had labored to do. And what did Solomon figure out? And behold, all was vanity. All was empty. All was senseless. All was worthless. All was hevel. And this was my portion of all... Excuse me. Uh, on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit. Notice this phrase again, under the sun. And I turned myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly, for what can the man do that cometh after the king, even that which hath been already done? Solomon said, if I can't find it, nobody can. What about the man that comes after the king? What about the man that comes after me? I've done it all. Surely he's not going to find satisfaction. 
Then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly, as far as light excelleth darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. He said, maybe satisfaction is in wisdom. But then he realized, that's not it. I myself perceived also that one event happeneth to them all. What's the one event that happens to every man? Hebrews 9, 27. It's appointed unto man once to die. Death happens to all men. And Solomon realized that when you're walking in a cemetery, you're going down the rows, and the wise man's head, uh, headstone looks just like the foolish man's headstone. You can't tell a difference once those men die. Then I said in my heart, as it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. And why was I then more the wise? Then I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever. Seeing that which now is, and the days to come shall all be forgotten. And how dieth the wise man, the same as the fool. Right now, there are almost 8 billion people on the earth. And you think about all the men that have ever lived before the flood and after the flood and throughout history. And you think about how thin our history books are compared to all the men that have ever lived. And that's because our lives here aren't about leaving a history. Our lives here are about something much more important. In my Bible, I drew a line from verse 10 to verse 17, just as a reminder. Verse 10, and whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. What does that do to a man? Verse 17, therefore I hated life, because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. If you give a man whatever he wants, he's going to live a senseless worthless empty life and he is not going to find happiness in this life because he's looking in the wrong place his perspective is under the sun verse 18 yea i hated all my labor which i had taken under the sun because i should leave it under the man that shall be after me solomon says purpose isn't in your legacy because guess what who knoweth whether the man that comes after me, whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? Yet shall he have rule over all my labor wherein I have labored, and wherein I have showed myself wise under the sun. This also is vanity. And so we could talk all day about how men try to find satisfaction in the world and how they never find it. What is man's problem? Well, we talked about man tries to take a spiritual hunger and fulfill it with physical things. Here's man's problem. Chapter 3. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. I'm going to read through this kind of quickly. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gather and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. What profit hath he that worketh? And that wherein he laboreth. I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of man to be exercised in it. Chapter 3 about sums it up. It's, It's everything that you can do. There's a time for every part of this life. But notice this. There is a time and a season for all these parts of life. That's man's problem. Man tries to take a part of life And make that what life is about. I have to have transportation. I have to have somewhere to lay my head. But my life isn't about accumulating wealth to get a nicer transportation. To get a nicer place to lay my head. 
And seeing as I cannot fulfill that physical, that spiritual hunger with anything physical, we ought to be content. We ought to be content. Verse 12 of chapter 3. I know that there is no good in them, but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. Concerning physical things, this is Solomon's advice after he tried everything. You cannot be fulfilled with physical things, so then be content with physical things. That's what's good. But how do we then have satisfaction in this life? How do we fulfill that spiritual hunger? Notice then Ecclesiastes 12. What is our purpose in this life? Remember now thy Creator in the days of the youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. Solomon here is talking about what he came to realize at the end of his life. And so if we're talking about the points of this lesson, we've covered the problem stated the problem studied, Solomon tried everything, and now we're going to talk about the problem solved. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble and the strong men shall bow themselves, there will come a day, if you live long enough, that due to age you will become weaker than you once more than you once were. And the grinders cease because they are few. As we grow older, we tend to lose our teeth. And those that look out the window be darkened. As we grow older, we start noticing a dimness of our vision. And the door shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low. I can't hear like I once could. And he shall rise up at the voice of the bird as I grow older, the less and less sleep. I can get at night, Solomon says. And he shall rise up at the smallest of things, at the voice of the bird, and all the daughters of the music shall be brought low. Also, when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fear shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden. We think about the idea of making a mountain out of a molehill. Well, that happens when we get older. Things that were once small become harder to deal with. Something so small as a grasshopper that you can hold in your hand, not literally, but small things, shall be a burden. Because why? Man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets. Here Solomon talks about that one event that happeneth to them all, death. Or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Think about that one phrase. That, that catches my attention. The pitcher be broken at the fountain. You think about something that carries something else. A pitcher that has water in it. And imagine that pitcher being dropped and the contents, uh, and the pitcher is shattered, but the contents go somewhere. Man is similar. Verse 7, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. When our pitcher, our body is broken... The water, our spirit, shall return unto God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all his vanity. He's saying, if this life 
was all that there was to life, everything would be empty. Everything would be senseless and everything would be worthless. If this is where it stopped. Vanity of vanities. If this is where it stopped. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words and that which was written was upright, even the words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd and further by these, my son, be admonished of making many books. There is no end and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Amen from the Memphis School of Preaching. But Solomon said this, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. One man's entire life summed up in a 12-chapter book, in a 12-chapter book summed up in one sentence. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And if you have a King James Version, you can clearly see that word duty is italicized. And I know other versions do that. But you can see that word duty is italicized. It's not there in the original text, but it was added that you might understand it. Well, this is one of those cases where I think this kind of hurts the intended meaning. For this is the whole of man. Man's whole. Man's entirety. Man's all is to fear God and keep His commandments. When you think about that word whole, that implies there's not room for anything else. And Jesus affirmed that in Matthew chapter 6. No man can serve two masters, for he will love the one and hate the other. We only have room in our lives enough for one master. Will it be God or will it be mammon? Wealth worldliness because you see God has many blessings to offer Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 1 3 tells us that all spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus but what does the world have to offer well Hebrews 11 there tells us the passing pleasures of sin those pleasures are fleeting those pleasures are for a season Ever since Adam and Eve, sin has offered three things to the world. Sin, sadness, or worldliness has offered three things. Sin, sadness, and sorrow. But God has so much more to offer. Life eternal. Freedom from sin. Romans 6 and verse 7 talks about freedom from sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. But how do we become freed from sin? Verse 3. Know ye not that so many, or how do you become dead? Verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. And being made dead, we become free from sin. This morning, if you would like to be made free, from sin we can show you how in God's word if you're a Christian and you need to be made right if you have lost sight of man's one purpose and you want to follow after that purpose this morning right now is the proper time to do so because eventually man will go on to his long time home as Solomon said man will die Hebrews 9 27 it's appointed unto man wants to die and we don't know when we will die. And so we need to make our priorities straight this morning. Would you do so as we stand and as we sing?